W-O-V-U-L-P, Cleveland. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture? Find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Greetings and welcome to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson and I have a very special guest today, no stranger to Open Door. I had him on the uh, television show airs at Community Focus Television in Macedonia. But today we are blessed to have him on the radio and we will migrate this broadcast to YouTube at some point in time. I am pleased to welcome to Open Door Kamal Abdul Alim. Brother Kamal, how are you today? I see better days, <laughs> but I okay. take what I get. All right. Well, I know that you're on the mend and uh, you're doing your best to get around, but I'm really happy that you decided to join us tonight. So I just want to give the folks out there who are listening a little background on you. Uh, we are blessed to have a world class musician on the airwaves with us today. He's a composer and masterful performer who works in cross-pollinating idioms of jazz, African music, and other musics of the African diaspora. His playing has to it both a power to astonish and a lyricism which rivets the listener, calling to mind the historical roots of African music, where music was not a separate art but an important and integral part of society and life itself. Kamal is committed to presenting to his audience a music which is spiritually uplifting, mentally inspiring and rhythmically stimulating. I would have to imagine that uh, you were the source of inspiration for those words that we just heard, uh, or perhaps as someone who knows you quite well and could, could weave all that magic and mastery into your description. And there's so much more and we will talk about it as uh, we have this conversation. So uh, let's just get to the origin. You, did you start out in Cleveland, Ohio, or did you have a, a place that you migrated to Cleveland from? No, I was born and raised in Cleveland, introduced to music by my mother at a very early age. I was fortunate to be blessed to be in a home where music was there all the time by either my mother playing the piano or records that my father yet had because he loved the big bands. And uh, just the general atmosphere was very, very, very musical. My mother taught me to play the piano basically before I could walk. I uh, was raised at the piano. My oldest, my earliest memories of when my mother had me in a basket and set me on the floor while she played the piano. I could see her feet moving on the puddles. As I got older, she set me on the bench in a bas- in the basket. And as I got old- older, she put my fingers on the piano, and that was the beginning. Okay. So you brought up your mother. I would be remiss if I did not let the uh, listening audience know that you are actually a brother of a guest that I've had on the uh, television show. I've uh, been blessed to have both of you on as guests, but your brother is Donald Freeman. Correct. Yes. And uh, talk about what it was like to uh, to grow up with uh, a brother uh, who was so passionate about learning as uh, as your brother. Donald was a genius. My oldest brother was a genius. He never fulfilled his full potential. Donald was a, a leader in civil rights new movement and very effective and very uh, contributive and committed. I watched him and his work and worked with him in the civil rights movement when I got out of the service for a brief period before I decided to leave that alone and to absorb myself in music. Uh, Donald was Donald found a library card. Uh, I believe he might not have he might have been maybe seven, eight, nine years old, and that was the beginning. And after that, Donald would go to the library religiously and come back with five, six, seven books, more books than he could carry. And we lived in the projects. You know, he had a 
habit of nicknaming everybody in the project. So at that time, they nicknamed Donald Uncle Wise Man because of his love for books and his continuous, continuous reading. He read night and day. All his life, Donald read books. He's still the same. He spent most of his time reading, writing, and uh, basically reading and writing. <laughs> That's yeah. been his life. And uh, so it's, it was very inspirational for me because I was a crazy little young boy running around in the streets trying to get in all the trouble I could. But I had a brother that monitored the, the essence of an intellectual. And uh, some of that had to rub off on me. Okay. So there came a point in time when you and your brother sought different paths. And I'm assuming that he stayed here in Cleveland and you decided to leave and you ended up in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, uh, well, you know, I went to the, the military in 1960. So that was my separation from my family. After three years in the military, I got used to being away from home. And therefore it was, uh, it was it was cool to come back home and reacquaint myself with my life as a civilian, my friends, my family, and to try to find myself. I began working at the post office. I had a very good job, bought new cars, nice clothes, girlfriends, but I decided that was not my lifestyle. So at the after, let me see, sixty from sixty three to sixty seven. I worked at the post office from the fall of 63. By 67, I had decided that I wanted to go to the Berkeley School of Music. I had began studying music again during the time I was working at the post office. I bought a trumpet out of prawn shop, and I said I was going to make this my life. And that's what I decided to do. I began studying at the Cleveland School at the Settlement. Cleveland Music Settlement, which I went back to after going there during my years in in school, in uh, middle school and high school, I studied music at the uh, music settlement. I was playing bass violin in the orchestra. I played tuba in the marching band at Glenville High. So I was always in music playing something. So at at the after being in the service and hanging out as a young man, I knew that Music was really and truthfully my love and inspired by my mother who said that while she was carrying me as an infant, everybody said that child would be a a musician because she played the piano all the time. My father worked nights, so that's what she did in the evening, played piano. My grandfather always supplied her with a piano as a young girl, so the piano was a great love of hers. And my mother played all kinds of music. My mother played classical music, pop music. And so I was introduced to all the uh, Beethoven, Bach, all of the classical musicians, as well as classical music, as well as pop music. My mother would go to the five and dime and buy the, the pop hits of the of the other particular time because they, the popular music was based in the movies. And so she would buy the, movies, the music from those movies. And... Uh, played them. So that was my introduction. So I would from her learn to play the same composition and do the same. So, so you you grew after, up go ahead. I'm sorry. After after letting all of this like kind of compiled in my mind after coming going through the military, going through that experience and getting out, re- reacquainting myself with civilian life and trying to interpret what I wanted to do with my life as a young man, because I was at 22, I think. And uh, so I searched, you know, trying to figure out what it was going to be, because it wasn't a life in the post office. That was too restricted. So I uh, looked for something to love. I figured that if I wanted to do something and commit myself, it had to be something that I really and truthfully love, which is music. So that put me on the path again of music because I always loved music. And uh, so 
that led me to Berkeley School of Music in 19, in, the, in uh, January, wait a minute, February of 1967. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you, you grew up playing piano, being influenced by your mother. You said that you went to Glenville High School and you played the tuba, and then you went into the military. And, and the bass violin. That was very important. Because yeah. Because then I played Mozart. Okay. And Beethoven. I right. I Beethoven's fifth. And Mozart had, I played his Jupiter orchestra, his Jupiter composition, which was very difficult music. Mozart wrote very difficult orchestral music. Beethoven's music was, was like lullabies to me. I love the Fifth Symphony. I love Beethoven's music. Mm-hmm. So you you went through all of those experiences. You worked at the post office. You decided that you wanted to make a life with music, and you, you made this, this de- determination that you were going to uh, go to uh, Berkeley uh, School of Music. So I'm curious about how you ended up going to a pawn shop after playing bass, violin, playing tuba, playing piano, and you selected a trumpet. When I was in middle school is when I began to play in a band. And I got in a band, a friend of mine in, in my class that got in the band, and so I Said, I love music. So I said, Can I get in the band too? He said, Yeah, now all you got to do is go to the, the music room and, you know, get, get, a, get a little test, you know, which they tested me. And I had good ears, I could hear and all of that. But the problem was the only instrument that they had left was a tuba. And it wasn't a tuba, it was a sousaphone. That's the one that you crawl up in. I had to crawl up in it because I was, I was, I wasn't big enough to just get up in it and, and sit in it. But it, that's what I did. I got in it, sat in it, blew a few notes, and the, and the, and the teacher was elated. The music teacher was elated because they needed a tuba player because, you know, the tuba is the bottom of the band. And it's hard to get somebody to play that instrument. And, I, you know, I love music. And, and I had been blowing on bugles. Somebody had a bugle in the backyard in the projects. And I think I got a hold of it. I'd go out there and Blew the neighbors are hey, God! <laughs> so when I got a chance to play an instrument in the band, I loved it. So I got on the tuba and got, got to be good tuba player, and I got stuck on it. The thing was, they didn't have any trumpets, so I had to choose a tuba, tuba because all of the instruments were taken. At that time, you know, you, you went to the, the band and school instruments, so what, whatever was available, was what you could get. I was the last guy to get to the band, so I got the last instrument that was available, which was the tuba. Okay. My love for the trumpet. I used to look at the trumpets in the in the band room. The kids didn't take them home, and they'd be hanging up. I wish I could take one home, but that that wasn't possible. That didn't happen. So when I got out of service and saw a trumpet in the window of the pawn shop, I didn't have a bass anymore. I lost my bass in the in the, while I was in the service, I had put it in the pawn shop, and when I went to Germany, my wife pawned it. <laughs> but I, did, I had, wait a minute, I pawned it, told her to get it out, and she didn't. So that was in the base. But anyway, so I said, well, my love for trumpet, let me get a trumpet. Something I really wanted to, to pursue. So the marriage began then in 1967. And 1967. Pursuing, All right. 1967 was a very good year in that it began your love affair with the trumpet in earnest. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU with Vince Robinson. My guest is Kamal Abdul Aleem. He is a composer and musician, and he's got an, a fascinating history. We're going to dive in a little bit deeper when we come back. We'll be right back after these messages. Wow, I wish there was a way I could listen to WOVU when I wasn't in the city. But there is. Really? Yes. You can go to WOVU.org. Go to our webpage. It's got everything on all the shows. Eric Nolan is in the building. This is Rachel Hill, the host of Her in the Huddle. This is Delvis Valentine. I'm listening. Yo, what it do is your girl DJ Coco Z. 
Hey, I am Talitha Kube from Let's Talk About It. Hi, this is DJ Black Unicorn. W-O-V-U dot org. Tap that app. Listen live. This is W-O-V-U 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Welcome back to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson, and I'm having a conversation this morning with Kamal Abdul Aleem. He is a world-class musician. He's one of Cleveland's many treasures. He's got some great company, folks like Eddie Backus Sr. and Vanessa Rubin and and uh, Detroit Transplant. My, my man, uh, help me out, Kamal. Who's my man from Detroit? From Detroit. Mike Katie, man. Mike Katie. <laughs> Mike Katie. Yeah, but see, I go back further than that. Vanessa was, wasn't even born when I was playing music. Okay. I go back to Tom Jones. I go back to, to Cesar Dameron, uh, uh, Tad Dameron's brother. I go back to Bob Cunningham, Bobby Few. The, the people you're talking about was infants. Eddie Backus. I always knew Eddie. Yes. But the rest of the people, they, was, they weren't even on the planet. Okay. So uh, when we were talking about your history, you mentioned that uh, you wanted to take music seriously and you ended up in Boston at the Berklee School of Music. Uh, walk us through what that experience was like for you. Now, let me hold you. I always took music seriously all my life. If I played a note on the piano of the infant, I took it seriously because my mother wouldn't let me take it any other way. That note ain't right. You're playing too loud. Stop using the pedal. So music was serious, always. That not, my mother was serious, very serious, focused woman. She wouldn't allow me to play crap. I had to play it right. If she showed me how to play, I didn't show you that. Then she'd come in and tell me, that's a whole note, that's a half note. So I always took music serious, and I still take music serious. Music is a religion to me because it's been my life. I live with music constantly in my heart, in my mind, and in my spirit. Okay. Well, I guess maybe when I was talking about serious, serious enough for you to walk away from a good paying job at the post office when you were getting the girls and you got the clothes and all that, but you decided that that wasn't the route that you wanted to take. You were going to study music and make it your life. Yeah, because I saw that all those things were material, frivolous material objects that I, I told somebody I could go out there and burn that brand new car up in a matter of minutes. I parked this brand new, I had a Riviera. I said I parked this brand new 1966 Riviera on the street. Somebody can come by and run into it and it'll be all mangled up. So I decided the material things had very little value to me at that point in my life that the thing that were important to me was music and spirituality. I can't leave the spiritual aspect out of it because that was my concrete foundation to become a musician. I knew that if I connected with God, he would guide me as a musician. That's why my name is Kamal Abdul Ali. I always sought the guidance of the creator in order to, uh, to confirm my commitment in whatever endeavor I had and have. That's uh that brings up an interesting point, uh, because in the earlier segment we talked about your brother being uh, Donald Friedman, but your name is Kamal Abdul Aleem. How and when did Kamal Abdul Aleem become a reality? Kamal Abdul Aleem became a reality in the fall of nineteen sixty nine when I moved to New York and finally was allowed to be exposed to the religion of Islam as it is practiced throughout the world as the, as the Sunni Muslim, but as the followers of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that was the last prophet to mankind. Okay. 
All right. So uh, let's circle back to uh, Berkeley because I really want to find out what it was like for you to finally get to what amounts to the promised land for some. I mean, you know, I know folks who are endeavoring to raise money to get to Berkeley. It's an expensive school. You know, what was it like for you to be this musician from Cleveland, Ohio, at the Holy Grail of music schools in the in the country of America? I'm glad you said the Holy Grail, because it was. There were no other schools in the in America that you could study jazz, the forms of jazz, and openly study and practice it. That was the reason I went to Boston. The schools, uh, the traditional music schools called jazz a bastard music. In in what do they call it? Uh, uh, unrecognized, uh, invaluable. It was like a throwaway, you know. Oh, they call it uh, Ill- illegitimate. They call jazz Ill- mm. illegitimate music. Wow. I was in the sixties, so the major institutions didn't want you to play it. When I went, if. if when I went, was trying, was thinking about going to uh, the Cleveland School of Music, the, what is it, uh, over there by Magnolia? Mm-hmm. The, the, they wouldn't even, if you play jazz in there, they throw you out. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, <laughs> I got out. I didn't go there. <laughs> I went to Berkeley because, number one, Berkeley was not expensive when I went there. It was a few hundred. It, it it cost you a few hundred dollars because Berkeley was not a, an established school at the time. As, as far as Berkeley was called the Schulinger House, and it had just changed because it was a place for professional musicians to go study the Schulinger system, which was for arranging and composition. And primarily, that was what the, the school of Berkeley was about. The musicians coming to Berkeley were professionals; they were coming from bands learning how to arrange and compose music because they would get paid more money if they were bringing arrangements to these bands. See, I came in at the end of the big band period. They were still big bands, and I came up in big bands as the foundation of learning how to play popular as well as jazz music. And then you had rhythm and blues, which was the way to learn how to play as a musician. A basic style of music with with the funk, <laughs> with the rhythms, and the, the the passion of music. So that's the road I traveled on. I played in rhythm and blues bands. I went to Berkeley and studied music so that I knew what the hell I was doing, and I was valuable to the rhythm and blues bands because I could read and write music. So it uh, it was a crossroads. When I went to Berkeley, people like the famous Harvey Mason drummer. He was one of my best friends. Uh, Ernie Watts had just left. Uh, Richie Cole, may he rest in peace, was a student at Berkeley. So when I was going to Berkeley, I went to Berkeley when there were professional musicians coming there, as well as the school was preparing professional musicians, preparing musicians to go out into to the bands and perform. It wasn't so much a school, you know, like the normal schools where you get a degree. And people were, didn't care about a degree at Berkeley. They wanted to get the foundation, which I'm thankful for. I got to understand the harmony of uh, popular music, jazz, and to understand the nuances and the, the aspects of playing it from some of the masters. What did you learn about composing while you were there? I was a composition major with my first year at Berkeley. So that I learned everything about composition in terms, in terms of the foundation of how to compose and how to arrange music using the, the chord structures that they do in in uh, popular music. That was most, the most valuable thing that I got from Berkeley because I learned about the, the traditional chord patterns and the chord patterns that are basic to any uh, compositional structures uh, in terms of pop music, and especially jazz, because jazz is based off of the basic 
chord structures of two, five, one, dominant, subdominant are harmony. So I learned those harmonies very well because that was what Berkeley was famous for teaching. So that gave me the basis to know how to play bebop and to compose using the the structural patterns of uh, of the of uh, popular music. So the two five one was it was a a prominent uh, progression that you utilized in your in that uh, idiom. Oh yeah, because it's subdominant to dominant harmony. Subdominant is two, dominant is five, back to one. Everything goes home, and it has to go home usually by five. <laughs> Get home by five. <laughs> wow. You so, know, as we... you know that, that that was concrete after the first year, and I had the thing about it that I had to jump on was I was playing songs that my mom played, and two five was one was a word of chord progressions in those songs. Plus, that my my friend and I had started trying to play jazz in high school, so we had a little introduction to that also. So it wasn't strange to me like it was. A lot of the, the students who were not professional musicians, but but young, well not young teenagers and young young music students coming to learn how to play music. Period. See, I knew how to play music. I wasn't a, a master musician, but I had a foundation. I had to learn how to play the trumpet, which was kicking my ass. So it was it was the 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 basis of me being able to have a good musical foundation my first year at Berkeley. When you say it was kicking your behind, what what made it difficult for you? I didn't have any training. I had some basic training when I was in Cleveland by this first teacher I had, Janos Kish, who was a Hungarian composer. He was a trombone player, but he was a good brass teacher. And he gave me a foundation how to blow through the instrument and and uh, use your diaphragm, but the trumpet is a very, very difficult instrument. And if you if you don't have the proper training, it'll kick your butt because you you're playing it basically on your own concept. And it took a long time for me to get a the real foundation. It took me about fifteen years until I ran into Bill Fielder in New York, who was a who taught most of the trumpet players out there now. Terrence Blanchard. Uh, Winton Marcellus, he taught, I can name a, a bunch of slew of them because he was the uh, the director of, of jazz at Rutgers University. And he and I became very close friends. And he taught me the foundation. He started me out, he said, "This, these are the principles of the trumpet. From breathing to the armature form- formation to the airflow, which is the secret to playing the trumpet. Bill gave me the keys. So I struggled around for 10 years or maybe more to get uh, to get to the point where I, I could move around on the instrument comfortably and, and, and confidently. Yes. I was after Berkeley. Berkeley didn't teach me how to play the trumpet. Okay. Berkeley gave me the foundation to write music and to, to interpret music. All right. The foundation of, of, of me playing the trumpet came from few guys that I met in Boston, Freddie Dahl and Bob Hagen, who were great trumpet players, who were being fast and come on. This is how you do it. And they, they tutored me. Okay. All right. So we're going to uh, we're gonna pick up in your, in New York, because you made that migration from Beantown to the Big Apple, and some magical things happened. We're going to go into that a little bit more when we get back. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. I'm Vince Robinson, and I'm having a conversation this morning with Kamal Abdul Ali. He is a composer and musician with an extensive background in the music, and we're going to dig in a little bit more when we come back. Back after this. 
Hi, this is Ken Hawkins. Hi, this is Pinky. This is T.C. Lewis. This is Shantae Chavers. This is Reggie Heyman. This is Bill Silverby Richards. If you're not listening to WOVU 95.9 FM, you're not in the mix, 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 mix. I'm Silverby cranking up. 24 hours of golden Welcome back to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson. My guest this morning is musician, composer, and great guy. I, uh, I, I'm i really honored to know him, honored to have had previous conversations with him and have spent some time with him. I took some photographs of him when he did a Wade Over Wednesday a few back, few years back, and uh, it's one of my favorite photographs. We're going to have to share that photograph with the world. But right now we are talking to him about his music history. He's told us that he uh, attended the uh, prestigious Berkeley School of Music back when it didn't cost a whole lot of money to go there. He honed his chops in composition and decided that he wanted to do something great with trumpet. And he studied with a master of the trumpet, ended up in New York and Brother Kamal, pick it up from there. Okay, I met Bill Fielder in, in New York through a friend of mine, Cliff Lee, who is Spike Lee's uncle. Uh, well, for me to go on to New York, Berkeley, I stayed at Berkeley about, I went to Berkeley a year and a half. I saw I saw after I changed to the, a music, uh, uh, instrumental major my second year, and I saw that they weren't really prepared me. You know, Lenny Johnson was was the guy that was the trumpet, uh, one of the trumpet teachers outside of Ray Katik. K- 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 I can't say his name. Ray Katikwa. He was a, he played for Broadway shows who was of little or no help. But Lenny really encouraged me, man. He played with Clark, Terry, and all the cats. And he just, he said, man, you got something that you could say on this instrument. Just stay waiting. Rich Lenny was beautiful. And I thank him. May he rest in peace. But I had decided after my experience at Berkeley, I started going on the road with a lot of rhythm and blues bands. And I didn't like the attitude of the rhythm and blues musicians. So, and plus that the, the music was not as a, a challenge to me as much as as, a, as it was a foundation. The greatest thing that came out of playing rhythm and blues was when I met Charles Evans, or Charles Nevels, one of the Nevels brothers in a band that I was playing in, in in New York. And Charles and I got to be very close and Charles was very encouraging. We used to practice together. May he rest in peace, but a beautiful soul, man, beautiful soul. But anyway, I left Berkeley after two years. I went to New York after working with a uh, rhythm and blues band through the summer. By the fall, we got to uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And I, I left the band there and went to New York with what I had and put it in a locker room in Pennsylvania Station and got in touch with a friend of mine and a friend of the family and stayed with her for a few for a few, for a brief period, because I was in transition, and I was in New York, man. I married New York. I said, I ain't going back to Boston. Although I had a wife in Boston, I'll go back to get her. But I'm, I want to be in New York now, because I had done all I could in Boston, and I got exposed by meeting a couple of the guys in New York that were coming to the New England Conservatory, because they were starting a jazz program. The first school to legitimize jazz, which was the foundation of where a lot of the teacher, a lot of the musicians that left there became teachers and, and, and were instrumental in beginning jazz studies in the music schools in America. However, let me get to me. I uh, was introduced to uh, a five friend uh, he gave me the number of Renee McLean, Jackie McLean's son. And Renee uh, was the like the 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 leader, you know, like like he wasn't the leader, but I can't I can't come up with the right 
uh, it's a word, but anyway, he was the foundation for getting guys hooked up with the Clark, Clark Terry's youth band. And I got involved with that. And uh, that was the beginning of me playing music in New York because it was a very good band, it was good musicians. A lot of us were rhythm and blues musicians off of the road doing the same thing. I was trying to learn how to play jazz as we were playing rhythm and blues. And from there, uh, I just continued to hang out with the bands. I, I was in about three or four bands at the same time. I played, I got hooked up with the jazz mobile. I played in the, in the because they had a program going on at the, uh, one of the schools in New York. So I went there and got as much information as I could. Cats like me, Morgan, began, began teaching there before he died. Kenny Dorham was there as well as uh, Joe Newman. Joe Newman was a, ter uh, was a trumpet teacher. Uh, Jimmy Heath was the band leader. So I was, I was in the front of some great, great musicians at that time. But New York was just full of music, man, everywhere, everywhere, Harlem, the, the village, the Lower East Side, look really the Lower East Side, that's where Rene lived and that's where the musicians would go because it was cheap to live there. And so and clubs was there and, and a lot of small clubs where the music was happening. So you went down, you went where the music was happening in, in New York, Harlem, the village, the Lower East Side. Uh, in the Bronx, they had some, some spots around uh, 174th Street, they had jam sessions. And around, uh, uh, not too far from Yankee Stadium, they had a club there, they had some clubs. So you would go from club to club, that's how you learned. All the jam sessions you could find, you go to them and play best you could, sink or swim. Whatever you could play, you played, and if you couldn't play it, you went home and tried to learn it, and come back next week, or the next day. So you were practicing and playing all the time. 24 seven musicians were, were 24 hour musicians. They said, you got a day job, look at you like something was wrong with you. You had to be on your instruments. You had to be out there, either studying and, and listening to the masters or playing in the bands of the masters. I, was, I hooked up with Frank Foster. I played in his band for a long time. Me and Frank, went to, we went to the Bahamas. I mean, not the Bahamas, but to, uh, to Jamaica together. I went several places with Frank, but Buffalo, New York. We I became close to Frank Foster. He was my mentor, uh, as well as Max Roach, who I became close to through my brother and through my experiences when I was went to U, the University of Massachusetts and was running a cultural program at Amherst College. You know, I'm all over the place, man, because I was always all over the place. I was uh, a musician in New York and going to. I decided to finish my education at the University of Massachusetts. So I was driving up there as well as I ran into a situation where I became the director of, of the uh, Black Cultural Center at Amherst College for three years. Meanwhile, in New York, I was playing with Frank Foster. I was playing with Kenny Barron's brother, Bill Barron, who was a master musician. I studied with him. He taught me a lot. He, taught, he picked up from where Berkeley left off. Because Berkeley had me confined to 251 and the patterns that you played in 251. But Bill taught me about the upper lower neighbors, the related notes outside of 251 and the dominance. So then I got hold of Barry Harris's uh, the dominant approach to jazz music using the, 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 the uh, five chord, which gave you all the possibilities that exist. You could eliminate two and just come off of the five and play much more to get to the dominant. So I learned a lot of that in the street from the musicians I would play with, from the 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 master musicians I would like Frank and 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 Bill Barron and all the other musicians that came along, Junior Cook, Bill Hartman. I man, I I can name so many that were part of me understanding. The, the alphabet of playing jazz music. Fortunately, I was in New York where all of them were at the time. And I saw that in. That's why I left New York and went to Paris, to France. Because New York died in the, night, in the early 80s. However, you know, I hope that I'm not skipping around too much because, you know, I'm saying a lot in a little bit of time. 
but uh, I hope that the, the understanding of how I was immersed in jazz music when I moved to New York. My, my, uh, my uh, uh, initiation to Islam came when I first moved to New York. As I moved, no, nobody in New York knew me by my name other than Kamal Abdul Alim because I adopted that. I, just, I went to the mosque and uh, had my, what we call our shahada, my, my commitment to Islam and adopted the name Kamal, which means perfect. Abdul Ali means servant of knowledge. I chose that name. I don't, I don't know why I chose perfect because that don't happen in this life, but I try to do the best I can. But uh, that was all part and parcel of me becoming the musician that I was because I had this foundation based on my faith that I could become that and that I could, I could concentrate that with the discipline of Islam through my daily prayers and through my commitment to go to it, to following the tenets of Islam, which I studied just like I studied music. I would go to the mosque. I would go, I would leave a jam session. I would, I would go to the mosque in the evening, stay to the evening prayers and leave the mosque and go to a jam session. That's how my life has always been. I always had my, hand, my horn with me at the mosque, going to the mosque. When I became Kamal, my mosque was, my trumpet was on my lap. So it was, it has always been my, my strong, my stronghold, you know, my foundation, my inspiration to continue. And it has led me all over the world by having the faith that Allah would take care of me no matter where I went. As long as I pursue my craft, committed to pursue my craft with honesty and sincerity which I have always been when it comes to music and which I feel has been the, the, the foundation of my success as a, music, as a musician. And my compositions have always been inspired by my relationship with, with God. All right, profound indeed. You know, you mentioned a wife some time ago. We haven't had too much conversation about her, but I want to get back to you and get and find out from you what happened with Mrs. Abdul Ali when we come back. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. I'm Vince Robinson. My guest is composer, musician, and as I said before, great brother, brother Kamal Abdul Ali. We will return on this Earthville Car Community Radio Station right after these messages. Wow, I wish there was a way I could listen to WOVU when I wasn't in the city. But there is. Really? Yes. You can go to WOVU.org. Go to our webpage. It's got everything on all the shows. Eric Nolan is in the building. This is Rachel Hill, the host of Her in the Huddle. This is Delvis Valentine. All the listen. Yo, what do you do with your girl DJ Coco Z? Hey, I am Talitha Kube from Let's Talk About It. Hi, this is DJ Black Unicorn. W-O-V-U dot org. Tap that app. Listen live. This is W-O-V-U 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. to Open Door with Vince Robinson. I am joined this morning by Mr. Kamal Abdul Alim. He is a world-class musician, and I am just so blessed to have him on the air with me today. You know, he's just dropped a few names on us, names like Barry Harris, Frank Foster. He hasn't mentioned Archie Shep yet, but I'm sure that that name is going to come into the conversation. But, um... He mentioned in one of the previous segments that he was living in Boston. He moved to New York. He's working in New York. Wife is still back in Boston. Let us know what happened uh, with with wifey. 
I went back and got her after I got to after I got settled in New York. I could I didn't have anywhere to stay, and she had a good job in New York. She was a, my my wife. My wife. Uh, she was my second wife. She had a she was an inhalation therapist, so she had a very very good job and a very good profession. So she could move around with her profession anywhere because she was in demand. So I um, went back to Boston after I got situated in New York. It didn't take, it took a few months for me to do that. And I got her and bought her to New York. New York was a challenge for her because she was from a small town in Ohio, Geneva, Ohio. I don't know if you're familiar. Geneva was a resort area. And she moved to Cleveland as a young woman and lived here. I met her in Cleveland. And so New York was like, wow, she was petrified <laughs> with New York. She had to make a big adjustment. And she had to embrace Islam because she was Muslim. And I told her, well, this is this is what I've chosen. Either you choose it or you leave me. So she had to contemplate that for she went to the YMCA, I think, for a day or two and came back. And after that, she became Khadija. That was the name she had. And Khadija helped me throughout her life, even when we got divorced after 10 years of marriage. To the day she died, she left me all the books she had. She left me the juicer, <laughs> the fruit juicer, the vegetable juicer. She left me all the things that she know that carried me forward. She helped me during that 10 p. She helped me during the early years of, of my uh, life in New York. She supported me. She supported me being a musician. She supported the lifestyle that I had to live as a musician. And she did everything possible to see that I succeeded. She used to make post. She used to, to when I had a band and uh, got gigs, she used to make little flyers for me. May she rest in peace. I love Khadija. She was a partner, a wonderful woman, and a wonderful spirit. We studied Islam together. We studied metaphysics together before we left Cleveland because I met her here in Cleveland. I was at the post office. We studied astrology. We studied numerology. We studied the spiritual sciences before I became Muslim because we were on a spiritual path. We wanted to understand that which is which exists beyond the reality of what we can see. And that still is a great interest of me, of mine, to understand the depth of spirituality. I pursue that like I do music. But I'm glad to say that Khadija and I had a relationship till she died. Khadija contacted cancer tried to cure her own cancer with the juice and natural remedies because she was a very intelligent woman. And she went to Germany to the cancer treatment center and stayed there because I remember her telling her, I'm going to kick this. She didn't get in. And she fought to the very last. She was courageous. And when she when she was dying, she I would talk to her because we were no longer married, but we always remained friends. She would, she would call me, the first person would call me on my birthday would be Khadija. As long as she lived, she called me on my birthday. I miss her because of her spirit. That's, that's a beautiful story, brother. And I'm so glad that uh, you shared that with me because uh, I, you know, I didn't have a clue about that part of your past. And I think it's good for folks to know. Um, mm-hmm. So you uh, talked about being involved in education as well. I believe you have a master's degree. You said that you were running um, an African-American studies department or a cultural center at a, at a university in, in Massachusetts. Talk about your career as, uh, as a, an educator. Oh, okay. That, my career as an educator it came about accidentally. I uh, decided when I, I was, I was going, when I was going to Amherst College, when I was, Going to UMass, I was a student. I, I was in the UWW for University Without Walls. So I was getting credit for, for the for musical act, activities that I was involved in in New York, recording all that stuff for 
was counted as a grade for my uh, undergrad work. Thanks to Max Roach. That's where I got close with Max Roach because I met Max, Max in Africa when me and Khadija went there for a trip there for a month to Ghana with exchange, uh, exchange students. Uh, well, exchange teachers and students. It was a teacher's vacation. And we went with, the, with that move, a group of people that stayed there for a month. Anyway, Max encouraged, I told Max that I was having problems. I was going to City College and uh, told Max about my problem. And he, he knew that I was, you know, coming up to Massachusetts. He said, come over to UMass to finish your degree. And thank, thank you to Max Roach. I graduated. I got my undergrad degree. Max told me when he gave me the credits and when he had to sign for my graduation, he said, okay, come on, I own you. I said, yeah, you do, Max. <laughs> but I can speak for forever and ever about Max. He was, he was a real partner of mine. Um, and my older brother, because he was close with Donald. Donald would, 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 would supply him with revolutionary rhetoric, <laughs> him mm. and Abby. <laughs> so, so he was getting those copies of Vibrations. Exactly. Max had all of them. As a matter of fact, Max told me, I, the last time I was over his house, he said, come on, I got something for you. Come over to the house. And I came over and had lunch with him. and We kicked it around. And uh, he gave me uh, a, a video of Clifford Brown before he died when he was interviewed in Chicago by Soupy Sales on TV. Mm. And he died right after that. He, wow. he was in Chicago and then he met Max. They went on and played. Uh, I, and then he left. I think he might have been Pittsburgh, but he died on the Pennsylvania Turnpike right after that. Wow, that, that's so, interesting. But you asked me about my educational career. I, I, uh, I, was, I, I got a job at Amherst. I got the job as cultural advisor to Amherst College because I was going into four colleges. It was four colleges, UMass, uh, Amherst, Smith College, New Hampshire. All those colleges were almost, you could walk down the street from one to the other. So I was in that area, and they were all developing black studies programs. And a lot of black students were demanding uh, black studies, black cultural uh, outlets. And they selected me after seeing me come up to Smith College, to uh, Amherst, to their college. And also, I think I played at UMass. And so they, they offered me a job. They said, you wanna, would you consider running our cultural center? So I wound up the cultural director of the Amherst, college, uh, Amherst Cultural Center, which became the Gerald Penny Cultural Center. I don't know what they call it now, but it was in a famous building called the Octagon. The building was shaped as the Octagon. So I ran a program there for three years, and, and I finished my BA degree in UMass in the same process, as well as interacted with the activities that were happening culturally at uh, UMass because they were very active in bringing, bringing people like the Black Composers Orchestra, Reggie Workman, and Jimmy Owens, a lot of, and then a lot of them, a lot of the musicians were also teaching uh, at uh, the colleges up there like me. You know, I got to be friends and close with uh, Marion Brown, Archie Shep. That's how I met Archie. I got me and Archie used to, I used to go over Archie's house, as well as Max, because it was a close-knit community. Uh, let me see, who else was the, the pianist, uh, who was a great pianist? Oh, his name will come to me. Anyway, we, we spent a lot of time, because he was teaching at Amherst. Oh, man. Okay. Anyway, his, his name will come to me. But... Uh, yeah, we were a lot of famous musicians there. So that was the, the, the foundation of me going into education because I had started there. Then uh, when I left the area, I moved to Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, I began, began to teach at the uh, East, which was a cultural alternative to regular education that was devised by... Uh, uh, 
I have to remember his name. It was a long time ago. Yeah, it was, but I shouldn't remember. J2, you will see. You will see. Okay. He organized East as a school and had accreditation for the school from the New York uh, New York educational system. So I, I started teaching there as a music teacher. That was my first uh, experience teaching kids. And from there, uh, because I had a degree, and then at the same time that I was teaching at the, I was doing a lot of things at the same time. I, I was going to uh, uh, Long Island University for education. I got a, ma- a master's degree in education because I decided I didn't want to get another degree in music. I said, well, what, what will a degree in music do? So I went into education and got a master's degree in education, which qualified me to teach in the public schools after I took the examination. But at the same time, a lot of things happened at the same time, simultaneously. The New York school system had closed down the music programs uh, in the early 60s. And there were no, no, no instrumental programs in the musical in the in the New York school. Now I can't think of the exact time that that closed. I think it might have been before before I moved to New York. So it might have been in the early in the late yeah the early seventies. They closed down the uh, music department because I came into the New York school system in seventy seven. So they finally decided after I think five or six years to reopen it. All the, all the instruments were in ball falls and they had no music teachers, except for the, I think they kept some of the uh, vocal teachers, choirs. But for the most part, the instrumental programs in the New York public schools was, was decimated, shut down, totally. And they decided to open them back up. So because of the shortage of musician, musicians to teach in them, they, they had a big opening for musicians that had a degree or college credits. I had a degree, so I, once I auditioned for the music position in, in the public schools, I had no problem. And that took me into the public school system where I taught music for, in New York for approximately, I think I was in the New York school system almost 10 years. I started out outside of music, and then uh, I taught history and uh, uh, general education, special education kids, because I had the uh, training and, and uh, degree, not a degree, but I had credits in special education. So I was valuable. I could go in special education also, which I did, because at that time I had remarried and got a, got a kid. I had my daughter, Asia, and I had a brother who was my stepson. We called him Jamaka, but his name is Raul Hassan Fisher. And so I became a father, as well as still trying to play my music, as well as finishing my master's degree and teaching school. Because then after the master's, I went for a PhD, which I had to stop because I, I went to Europe to do my recording, to finish finish my music. I had to get out of education. But anyway, I, as an educator, I uh, was a, what you call a transit music teacher. I taught in three or four schools at the same time. That meant I went from school to school. And I was a valuable teacher because I was good enough to work with kids and get them to play fast enough for them to do. If I went in in the fall, I tried to have them to play a Christmas program. So that was always my goal. And then, of course, by the end of the school year, to put in the play for the graduation. So I was quite successful and and in demand to work in Brooklyn in the uh, public school system, which I did, as I said, up until uh, 95 when I decided to get out of that, out of the education system. Okay. Well, Brother Kamal... 
this hour has just flown by. It seems like we just barely scratched the surface. You did. We didn't talk about, about your, your your Europe experience. We haven't talked about your time in Cleveland. Obviously, we're going to have to come back and do a part two to this show. But I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us on Open Door with Vince Robinson and welcome you back to the airwaves as time permits. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right. And thank you for listening. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, and make today your best day. Peace. Peace.